do. God. Swear chase sometimes. All right, now let me get your timer on this one. So this works just like any other camera. Whatever it sees that is going on, and also the work that this body is doing. Okay. So somebody around you comes to say something. Yes. And then or their slides aren't sharing in the way. So when they're pitching, you want to try to get to them in their slides in the shot. Yeah. And then for QA, you can do two shots, you know, one where you get them and the judges, or you can just kind of like try on that. But most part, you just do the have one. It'll be how sound will come to you. <laughs> Gentle touch on it. So we're live right now. Correct. Yeah. So people are hearing us. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just that's my own screen. So uh, yeah, there's a slight delay. <laughs> So we have five minutes to pitch. This, is pitch this. so set it. Turn it on. Oh, that's not me. My spike headphones. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Startup Summit 2022 that continues with Thursday night, day four.
hopefully tonight, just looking out the windows, we won't have the tornadic interruption that we had last night. Uh, so if you didn't catch that, be sure to watch our YouTube channel and see the excitement as that tornado warning blows through right as we're announcing the winners on the uh, last division. Uh, so hopefully we won't have that tonight. Um, tonight is our second two to last competitions. We have the brick and mortar division, and this is for entrepreneurs who have an idea for a retail service or lifestyle business here in the community, um, such as a new coffee shop or other local boutique. We have a lot of great entrepreneurs presenting that. And then the second competition tonight is our new product three. These are probably the most advanced startups uh, from a technological standpoint here at Mississippi State in the East Center. Uh, so it'll be a really fun night. We've got some great presenters. Our first division here in brick and mortar, we have five presentations tonight, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, we have three fantastic judges here that have a really tough decision to decide which ones of you get to take home one of three prizes, one of four prizes, excuse me. So before we get to the prizes, I want to have them take a moment to uh, introduce themselves. So first we'll start on my left here, Ms. Shelby Baldwin from Rocket Systems. Shelby, welcome. We got started in the entrepreneurship center um, when we were in college in about 2018, and our app essentially just manages influencer marketing for um, retail stores, online stores, but even Shopify specifically. So if any of you have heard of online stores, you probably know what Shopify is. So we're a Shopify application, just a little bit of background, but great. To, excited to be here, excited to hear everyone present. Good luck, everybody. Pass it on. All right, hello everybody. I'm Calvin, Calvin Wadi. Uh, super excited to be here. I was in you guys' shoes, well, show me, I wrote for you guys' shoes 2019. Um, so I'm excited to, to hear what you guys got and uh, good luck. Good evening, I'm Brian, I'm the uh, co owner of the local star holders of Restaurant Tower. The guests are in Roman Taco and uh, Dungeon Swell. And heard that we're going to be having some great presentations tonight. Looking forward to it. Awesome, let's do our judges round of applause again. So tonight's competition for the brick and mortar division has three prizes. First place, $2,500. Second prize, $1,000. Third prize, $500. And then there's a fourth prize, which is people's choice. So be sure if you didn't get a program, make sure you get a program. There's a card in here to mark your people's choice. And we, we actually had an error on our side with the tornado logistics yesterday. We have a fifth presenter tonight, that's Kenya Thompson. So make sure you consider Kenya in your people's choice consideration as well. She's joining us and uh, you will definitely want to hear her presentation as well. All these great prizes don't just happen. Uh, we've had some amazing sponsors. Um, please refer to the front of your program and check those folks out. Banktel Systems. Founded over in Columbus, Taste Maker, Read Food Technology to Jackson, uh, J5 Global, also over in Columbus, and then Industry Services Co. All these were um, some tremendous friends at the East Center that are literally paying the bill to try to help you get your ID off the ground. So be sure to thank them if you get the chance. Um, some housekeeping logistics. So each team will have five minutes to present and three minutes for QA. QA is reserved just for the judges. So if you have any audience questions, please just hold those to the end. When we have a break, and feel free to meet up and ask those of each other. But for the purpose of Q&A, let's make sure to reserve that time for the judges. If you have a cell phone on you, please silence that now or any other chirping, buzzing, electronic device that um, can otherwise distract our presenters tonight. Please take a moment and uh, handle those. And finally, if you have any questions throughout the uh, presentations or or anything that we can do to help, please see one of our team in the black polo shirts and floating around here. We'd be more than happy to help. So with that, we will get started with our first presenter, and that's going to be Mr. Isaiah H. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isaiah H. I am an oncoming chef. I cook and I cook under a growing random chef back at home in New York City. Um, 
problem solve our business and bring better food to campus, better taste to feel. So on um, trash and every like it closed out three and eighty percent of people complaints about the food being nasty. And I'm here to bring a better taste and better opportunity for students come come together, like to be a focus shop for a different type of food, you know, different uh, just foods, you know. This is my own First off, food is great. Uh, sorry for those who can't, can't have any tonight. Uh, but yeah, you said you do 200 more grams each and finish up working with six shepherds too. What was that experience like for you? And what was something that you learned in that, uh, in that environment, business wise? Um, it's pretty tough because I don't turn people off for a we like to scream at people. So you kind of take that in. And just like <clears throat> learn things and try like different things with different ingredients. Sometimes you, you have the moment when the stuff is bad, but you gotta get back up and learn from that. So talk a little bit about your customers. Um have you I'm assuming you've sold some of this food, have you made revenue? Um who have your customers who's an example of your customers that can sell to students primarily? How do you market yourself? Like talk a little bit about your selling process. Yeah, I got some, some flyers here, and two people in the back that had common food. So, that being said, I'm going to hook it. Yeah, so it's definitely delicious. Um, he started off in the kitchen of the city, which is a community hall at the city's place. And from there, he's just grown. And I'm personally a part of Greek life. Here on campus, so I've given him far about totally helped him grow, and he has many other friends who just have other actors to go on campus, so they definitely help him. The flyer, but it definitely helps with the food to get to those Tell us a little bit about what you might uh, bring to the market that's not currently here, what you might do different than, than what we already have. Um, so, right, there are some no food. Like I'm gonna expand food, any of food. Well, vegan, I can make vegan food. Um, the making food is for Texas. It was good benefit for the people here on campus and for myself. And it seems like we have customers. Do you have any revenue numbers that you can speak to right now? Yeah. Um, hmm. Um, so, how do you, I mean, you know, food's great, like you've already said, you have customers. What are your plans for scaling these bigger? Because, you know, eventually it's going to get to a point if you're doing well that you can't keep managing it by yourself. So, do you have a plan for building out a team, potentially getting a physical location? It doesn't have to be in the next couple of weeks, but just long term vision plan. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I've been having people come to Charleston, they get the club in there, they get the job physical. Get a team up with them to expand from them. One of my last questions is just speak a little bit about uh, your competitors here at Starkville. Uh, I know you said the industry dying, but uh, are there any other competitors that you'd be, uh, that you've done research on that yeah, then use their chefs in the industry? Um, to be honest, not really. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the walk in closet. Come on down.
and resting. So, have you ever had too many clothes? Some that couldn't fit anymore, some that just you feel like a way out of style, or some that just are too tight, knowing that food bellies have really just never done any service to me anyway. I bet you just toss them in the trash or try altering them to be something else, but it didn't turn out right. On the flip side, have you ever feared running to somebody with the same outfit, wanting to experiment with different clothes without spending too much money, um, or find a middleman to sell your product? The walk in closet is here to meet all of your needs. From trendy name, name brand, staple items, sports apparel, the walk in closet is bound to bring versatility to MSU's campus. What's the problem, you may ask? Okay, so Starkville is a small city, but there is not that much to choose from as far as like shopping. Um, and so with our big population, I believe that we need a more variety in the aspect of fashion. Another problem is the fashion industry contributes to so much environmental problems. It's one of the um, top emitters of CO2, and 85% of textiles that are produced within a year are sent back to landfills within a year. So a solution to this problem, I believe, is by taking what seem like old items to one person and presenting them to new to others, we can reduce how much our, how much items are going back to landfill. Um, the state of development is we're still on the rise, we're still doing research, um, we haven't began selling, but we have been trying to expand our our inventory. So right here, I have a few items that are mine actually. Um, so right here we have a if you go into like an MSU event, you could probably wear this, and all of this is used on the way. Um, if you're just going to class, you could probably wear this. You could probably wear this MSU sweatshirt, which I bought at the lodge for sixty dollars. And with the walk-in closet, you'll be able to find it at a lesser price. If you're trying to go out and trying to go out to eat with a friend or something, you could possibly wear this, and you could style it with the neighboring item. My friend right here has a coach purse and a Kate Spade purse. Um, I was actually gifted one of those and the other one was donated to me when I was telling about my brand. So how this works is we meet with ordinary people, they present us with different clothes, we sign a receipt paper that basically tells them how much we can sell this for the market. The reason we don't like give them money up front is because we bear all the costs and risks without having a guarantee that it will sell. However, by selling like a receipt um, paper, um, they could agree to getting 40% of the property while I get 60%, and then if it doesn't sell, or return this film, or we'll donate it depending on what they chose. Okay, so how how is it how it works and how is it unique? So I know a lot of people around here start because I've talked to over like 50 students. Um, most of them are my friends and most of them like classmates. And I asked them what's something that you would start Starkville had as far as fashion and what are we missing? And a lot of them said um, either the apparel was too high or like as far as like trying to find something different and fashionable, they would either have to go to nearby cities or shop online. So I believe with the walk-in closet, our main um, source of selling will be online. Um, We'll also have in-person things. So you seek to go to pop -up, local pop-up shops and sell um, around Starkville or Big City. Okay, so how I'll sell and how I'll make it better. I bet you're wondering like how I'll put a price on the item. So what I would do is, um, depending on the market price of the certain item. So for example, I bought the sweatshirt at the lodge for $60. So I wouldn't sell it again for 60. I would sell it less while making sure I um, make money from it. And I believe this is better because we won't just have an online um, platform, we'll also have in-person. And that's what a lot of my competitors um, lack is they either are online selling or they in-person. And we believe with doing both, we can make more revenue. Um, so it's estimated that like resale stores to make up to 42,000 a year was only implemented three thousand between three thousand and ten thousand dollars for startup costs, and with our online platform, we believe we can make even more. 
It said that the resale fashion industry is on the rise, and within five years, it will be um, up into the billions in revenue. Thank you. You did a really good job. Uh, I think this is an idea that uh, could definitely work. So tell me how I would find out about you. What kind of advertising we do? How we go about acquiring and clothing from, from people that want to uh, want to use your service? Okay, thank you for the question. So our main sources of marketing is we'll have an online platform, as we know with like this generation, especially our main avenue of like getting information is through social media. So we will be on all platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. We'll also have flyers and business cards. Um, we will market especially to those that are in different um, groups. So like we'll market to the Greeks, the athletes, to um, other on-campus organizations so we can get our name out there. And how we'll, I guess, well, like, how we'll like market and sell is We'll have a um, flyer that has like the basic information, um, and it'll be simple in a simplified, simplified version. So we'll have everything that you need to know about if you're trying to sell or if you're interested in buying. So, you know, I've mentioned that the resale industry is growing, and I've seen that trend myself as well. I guess my question is how much research have you done into other? Resale businesses. I know I'm not sure if there's any in Starkville, but even in similar areas like Tupelo or Columbus, kind of in the state. Just because I would be interested to see like how your profit split of 4060 compares to other stores um, and kind of how they go about acquiring the clothes and disposing of the clothes. Like you know, just kind of would be interested to see your research on that. Okay, so I've done some research not just in Starkville but amongst the youth in the state. Um, we have a, our two main resale stores in Stockton is Revolution Confinement and Promise Thrift Store. Um, we all, I actually talked to the woman way before I had even decided to start this consignment. And the way they do it is they only sell, well, they only make money by um, people buying. So they never give you money on the spot. Um, we believe that this is good as far as making money. And of course, if you have like a in-person shop, you have to spend more like on a building, um, rent, stuff like that. Um, and as far as like globally, there are lots of resale, um, resale shops like Upthrifts. Um, I think Shopify, if I'm not mistaken, does have resale on there, and just a few other different things. Keep mindset that Sarkozy is a big way. Is there any, any limitation on? The styling or clothes of clothes that you will accept. Uh, I know some designer stores, and there may not be designer but resale stores. You have to have name brand only. It can't be any one of the clothing. So I was wondering if that was the same thing. Okay. So yes, I will have limit. The only person that will be looking at the clothes is me. So I could be a little biased, but I'll do as much research as I can to make sure that um that I'm marketing to like customers I want at the moment. So like, especially around Starkville, students are always looking for MSU apparel, but students like me don't always want to spend a lot on the MSU apparel. Um, so mainly we will try to stick, we'll try to sell seasonal items. So we, we, want, we won't sell like coats in, in the spring. Um, with, with resale, um, a mistake that they often make is they take in too many items and at one point they're taking in so many items they're not making money for it. So that's why you see like Goodwill um, and like Palmer's thrift store, they just have a lot of clothes, but they're not selling as much clothes they're bringing. Thank you. Okay, and our third presenter is going to be the barista with Deja Hall.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Vaisha Hall, and I am seeking to be the co owner of a new mother daughter startup brick and mortar. The Bargainista will be a fast forward, trendy, upscale resale shop for women, and we will provide clothing, shoes, accessories, and different handbags and stuff of that nature that they can shop at an affordable price. Now, thrifting is actually becoming a very popular trend in my generation. Older generations love to thrift shop as well, but it is becoming a trend in my generation. So, secondhand shopping is projected to double in five years, with 76% of first-time buyers saying that they plan to continue shopping secondhand, and the resale industry is actually expected to double in particular with the amount of people that shop in resale compared to the fast fashion industry. So many of you may know Fashion Over as a very popular fashion brand or line. Um, that is just an example of a fast fashion um, store. So imagine that I am an example of your target profile. I am a college student. I want to shop on a budget because I have a lot of fees to cover, a lot of books to pay. So I don't want to cut into my budget or spend too much money whenever I am shopping for clothes. There are a few problems that may arise whenever I am shopping resale. One of those problems being resale prices being the same or almost equivalent to retail prices. Whenever I shop resale, for example, if I ordered a polo shirt that's originally $50, I don't want to go into a resale store and pay $40 or $45. So there needs to be a differentiation between resale and retail prices. I don't want to walk into Goodwill and pay basically retail prices when I'm looking for these. Another problem that some resale shops and, re and their shops have is they don't really provide a quality shopping experience. You have to sort through all of the old clothing, things that are out of style. You have to sort through large sums of inventory that they have for your rats. Um, which can be very inconvenient for people who just want to find what they're looking for and get out. I'm not saying all resale shops do this, but for the majority, when you walk inside a thrift store or you're going to a yard sale, there's a lot of junk everywhere. Sometimes it's dust, there's not excellent, high quality customer service. So we want to provide that upscale environment that all of our shoppers deserve. So we will provide our customers with affordable resale prices so they don't have to worry about cutting into their budget. We will also provide a clean, well-lit environment inside of our resale shop. We will make sure everything is organized. So we're not going to have um, a large sum of inventory or one rack for our customers to ship through. We're going to constantly bring in new items um, and change them out more than once in a day so that way they can come back. They always have something new to look forward to. They don't have to shift through a lot of different things. We also will only accept high quality and high end items. So they won't have to worry about the problem of going to Goodwill and, oh, I'm looking for a Nike shirt. And they have to sort through all of those. So first, we have to understand the different trends that are in our industry. Second, we will do the dirty work for our customers. So we will source for all of the items in Goodwill or America's Gift Store, and we will provide those quality items. And we will also give customers the opportunity to bring in items of their own so we can keep certain things out of here. This is just an example of how we can sell our items, the cost, the profit margin, the revenue. As you can see, if we sold 250 glasses every week during the spring, that's $500 in gross profit. So customers are getting a bang for their buck, and we're also, we also have a bank. This is an example of our social So 
some presentation. Um, I know you mentioned you said it's a mother daughter duo, right? So is it your yes. mom helping you out with this? Yeah, I would love to hear a little bit more, a little bit more about that dynamic, like how you guys work together. Who's in charge of what? What are your plans as far as getting this started? Are you going to get a physical location? Just talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so my mom and I, we work together a lot to get this job done. We have already done this on Facebook Marketplace. So we source high quality main brand items from those thrift stores. And we've added our own markup that we think will work for consumers. So we've already sold items and shipped them across the country. We do that together. So we take the items, we make sure everything is washed and dry, we make sure everything is steamed. And then we have like a nice background that we use to take the product photos and upload them to the Facebook Marketplace platform. And yes, we do play a bit in our Um Yeah, just talk to me a little bit about your competitive market. Um, I know there's a, a raw system of Starfield. I think it's uh, Marshall Center. Sorry. So, yeah, just talk to me about maybe the, the impact of that or any other competitors in your market on distribution. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier with Goodwill, America's Thrift Store, in my hometown, we also have a shop called Plato's Closet. So, people are able to bring in secondhand clothing. And it's just not the same luxury experience that we want to provide our customers. When our customers walk into our shop, we want them to feel like they are shopping at Gucci or Louis Vuitton. We want to offer that upscale experience. We don't want them to walk in and, oh, it's just the same thing that they've constantly seen over and over. That's what we want to offer. That's different. Yeah. And who is your target customer and what part of the store will be in the state you're shopping in uh, and what? You anticipate your cost being in terms of rent, overhead, and run that different board location. Okay, so we know that the cost are, is going to be good over $1,500. We've looked at a few places in our hometown. We wanted to start off in our hometown, which is Gulfport. So starting off on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, seeing how it works out, and then later on expanding to college towns because I know that this will do well. In college towns like Oxford, Starkville, Tuscaloosa, and you know the different places of that nature. So by winning this grant, I know that we'll be able to cover the rent, the lights, all of the different overhead costs that come with running a brick and mortar. Because running a brick and mortar is not cheap. Well, great presentation. I should say that first. Could you go back to the slide about the year um, overhead? Expenses slide. Oh, well, that was just about the time. Okay. Not over the year. Okay. Uh, did you have any thoughts on what marketing expenses were? Yes. Yeah, so, I know this is the business model. I'm just curious about the marketing expenses. Yeah. So, creating the flyers, the business cards, printing expenses, shipping expenses to get the business cards from the supplier to our company, also social media advertising. So I know TikTok offers ads, Facebook offers ads, and so does Instagram. Those are definitely going to be costs. This model right here is just showing you how we will price our products. As far as like an overall budget, we have not decided that yet. We want to first get the cost of the store and then the cost of our products, the supplies, and then all the means of advertising and marketing. Do you anticipate that you would need employees at the first location, or did you and your mom would provide the labor? At the first location, I think we could provide our own labor. But moving forward, as we plan to expand and open more than one location, which we definitely plan to do, we will definitely need employees. Your last question. Thank you. All right, our fourth team is going to be KP Candlewood Co. with Kenny Parks. 
And this is just a reminder, don't forget about people's choice. If you don't have a program or don't have a card, be sure you get one, because that's going to be important here in the end. And, uh, and so we'll go from there. Good afternoon. My name is Kennedy Parks, and I'm a senior psychology major from Memphis, Tennessee. When I was 11 years old, I faced my greatest trial, which was the loss of my father to suicide. As I grew up, I realized that he neglected his own big book, and I strived to put my first for the rest of my life. During my sophomore year of college, I faced another test of perseverance. I realized I was in another state alone, still grieving the death of my father, and going through common things many college students go through. I was so focused on reaching the finish line and doing all I could to reach that point that I started to slowly neglect my own mental health, which my father did in the past. This is why I created Kate and Handling Code LFC. Did you know 43.8 million adults in the United States suffer from a mental health issue, but nearly 60% of those people reported they have never received mental health services? Additionally, 39% of men and 32% of females practice self-care. 32, 39, that's a pretty decent number. But let me put that in real world perspective. That's only 61 million men in the whole total male population of 161 million. And only 53 million women of the total female population of 166 million. It's, that isn't even half of the gender population for each category. Are you seeing the problem that I'm seeing here? Many people in Starkville and surrounding cities have to travel to find luxury camps. Additionally, many adults in the United States have listened to generational opinions about mental health and do not know where to find resources if they need them. Finally, KP Kendall and Co. wants to fight the stigma behind mental health so that we can have get more people to find the help that they need. But there's no worries. We're here to help. Did you know that the scent of a candle can enhance the limbic system, produce hormones to regulate mood and boost your energy? Additionally, our customers will receive a unique self-care tip and a happy sticker in each package so they are reminded to participate in some type of self-care. Our company provides an eight ounce homemade candle made of 100% soy wax, which means you get a clean and safe burn for you and the environment. Additionally, a sole part of our mission is to enhance your self-care journey. With our self-care essentials, including journals, mugs, and apparel, our customers are motivated and encouraged to participate in some type of self-care activity. So, when you think of a candle, you think of some quick alternatives like Walmart, <laughs> TJ Maxx, and Bath, TJ Maxx, and Bath Garden. But what sets us apart is our use of 100% soy wax. Soy wax is beneficial because it does not release toxins into the atmosphere. Additionally, we have a variety of scents ranging from calm, fruity, booty, and masculine. Not only do we have candle products, but we also have self care essentials, which aid you in your, in your journey for self care. We have incorporated subscription boxes so that our customers do not have to worry about placing an order every month. Additionally, we've created newsletters which provide our, our customers with positive news, self-care activities, and positive affirmations. Finally, the biggest separation between us and our major competitor is the message that we provide. We hope that our customers have a different perception of mental health after becoming a member of our brand. So on this table, you'll see some of all the products that we offer the average cost to make them, the total cost of the product, the margin, and the profit. We have participated in a pop-up shop where we have made over $700 in just four hours. And recently this week, we launched our website and we've made over $850 on Shopify and with orders still rolling in. So some marketing strategy that we have was creating a website access for people who are in the surrounding Mississippi area. So far, we've gotten orders from seven different states and in large order from Australia. We also want to purchase social media ads such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that we can market to all audiences. I'm also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, so I will use that lifelong organization to promote my business. 
We also want our company to be an educational resource. So collaborating with mental health influencers, bloggers, and therapists so that we can create this atmosphere for our customers. We have three pop-up shops lined up, two in April and one in May, and we would like to introduce our products in boutiques and hotels so that we can reach a different range of audience. Also, we've been collaborating with local business people, and some tips and tricks that I've gotten from them is having a consistent social media presence. I would like to engage with my customers as much as I can so that I can reach as many people as possible to spread my message. KP Campbell and Hope isn't an average evil company. We strive to change the, message, the perception of mental health. It is time for us to take our mental health just as serious as our physical health. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation today, and always remember, you always matter. That was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Uh, very, very uh, impressive what you've done here. So tell me what this candle cost you to make and tell me what you sell it for and tell me a little bit about the subscription box that you made. Okay, so for that candle, each candle on that table, it costs $5.50 to make the candle, including the wax, the lid, the container, and the fragrance. Um, on the, this right here, it says make wax melts as well. In the beginning, I usually just threw the excess wax in the water bottle and just threw it away. It actually cost me, it's pretty much free to create a wax mill and I'll sell them for $5. In the subscription box, I will include a different KP Candle & Co. product for each customer. I have a data sheet to make sure I don't send the same customer the same thing that they received in the past. And in the subscription box will receive to their, arrive at their address each month around the same time. Great presentation. So um, out of the revenue that you guys have made, uh, I think you said seven hundred is a pop-up shop. Is that so the pop-up shop that made and, it? And the eight hundred is from online sales. Mm -hmm. What of that was subscription? Um, we just introduced the subscription with this new launch of the website. And when do you anticipate the launch of the subscription? Um, it's live right now. We're posting a social media graph for next week. Okay, got it. Yeah, my question was kind of around that same. Topic. So I know you've made sales. What is the breakdown between all these products? So is it mainly candles that have been sales, or have you also sold like sweatshirts, t-shirts, journals, other things? Of course, we're most mostly a candle company, but I wanted to add the you know, face of self-care is my main focus. So we've got most of our sales from candles and wax melts, but surprisingly, a lot of people have shopped our self-care essentials in this recent launch. So I'm going to keep that going, adding more things like bags. Journals, more journals, hard covers, soft covers, things like that. Yeah, and I, I love the spin on mental health and like actually incorporating that into your business. I wonder, I wanted to ask, have you thought about implementing um, kind of like a percentage of each sale goes to mental health research or like something that actually gives back and beyond just to the customer, but you know, bigger than what you, you know, your business? Have you thought about that? Yeah, so actually, I'm going to talk with NAMI, which is a national alliance of mental illness, and I'd like to donate three to four percent of my annual sales to their organization at the end of each year. Just curious, what influencers did you work with um, that have the you know, kind of uh, mental health focus influencers did you work with? So as I started this journey of finding mental health influencers, I realized that Instagram is a lot of scam bots. And so a lot of people think you are a real person. So I started locally scaling it, like people I know from my hometown in Memphis, since it's such a large area. And I've also found some Instagram influencers who actually will respond to me and have a very high following list, follower profile. And so they're giving me some like graphics I can post on social media, some blogs that I can put inside the newsletter that each customer receives each month. Okay, so I would love to ask you about scaling. So obviously you're kind of just starting, you've already made some revenue. What are your plans for scaling? So, I mean, if you were to be able to take your sales from 850 a week to five grand a week or whatever, obviously that's going to require more products, probably more employees. Like, talk about kind of your plans for the future. So, um, I graduated in May and I'm going, planning to go back to home to Memphis, Tennessee, and get my master's and join the PhD program for clinical psychology. Um, eventually, I want to open up my own mental health and wellness center, which I house everything that you might need in regards to mental health, psychiatry, therapy, and my candles. Um, eventually, I want to open my own store where people can come in and make their own candles to see why I love making candles so much. And it can be a self-care activity while also being something they can do with their family and friends. 
Um, of course, I will hire, I'm actually hoping to hire like an assistant or something in the future, in the next couple of weeks, depending on how revenue does for the next pop up shop, so that I have no back having borders, making candles, and all that. It's fairly easy to make a candle, just a very time consuming thing. Thank you so much. All right, and moving on to our fifth and final presenter tonight. This will be Kenya Imagines with Ms. Kenya Thompson. Love that. Hello everyone. Hello everyone, my name is Kenya Thompson and I'm the owner of Kenya Imagines LLC. In our business, I create and sell software as well as drawing and photography commissions. This piece right here is called The Mask and it is a drawing that is 19 of uh, 22 by 30 inches using collage, pastel, and color pencil. So when determining the artwork that you want to purchase, we're first going to go over the size. I do pieces that range from six inches by eight inches all the way up to 22 by 30 inches for large drawings and paintings. And then we're going to go over the media and the media. What kinds of materials are we going to use? Paper, wood, canvas, and then we'll use wash, charcoal, graphite, for example. And finally, based on that process, we will go over the number of artworks purchased and compare that to the materials. So that on top of that, we can come to the total price that comes with the shipping label, which is $19.20 through my, through my business. And all that together will determine our total price. This is called the Purple Cow, and it is a pastel drawing using gouache on paper and is 22 by 30 inches as well. So some things that people come to me when they're trying to purchase artwork is that they don't even know where to begin. They don't know what size or any of this. So first off, we're going to go to my marketing side of the business. We're going to check out my social media and my website, specifically the social media first, so that we can see what kinds of artwork are being created currently. Then we're going to visit my physical portfolio as well as my virtual portfolio to see all of the artwork that I do, all the textures, all the patterns, all the colors, and all of the new geometry that's coming out of my brain right now. This piece is called Earth, and it is 11 by 14 inches on canvas using gouache. What's unique about my business is that I have a national influence in traveling the country. And I also use striking and potent colors, as well as me being a flourishing art business. I have influences of architectural and musical um, qualities from culture. This piece is called Funk, and it is an Italian print using a color graph technique for the background and is nine by 12 inches. So each piece purchased and created by me um, varies in price drastically depending on materials, time frame, whether it's an original piece or whether it's a mass produced. I have upcoming show sales at the MSU Idea Shop here at Starkville, and I have sales through my online website, and I do my, I do my marketing through Facebook, through an upcoming Facebook page, as well as through my website once again and through Instagram. So this piece is an original, as well as all the ones that I've shown thus far, and it is called the skull. It is 18 by 20 inches, and it is an oil painting on wood with a cradle. I would like to introduce customized shipping boxes for my business, as well as stickers, so that there can be much a much more professional and personalized experience with the shopping. I'd also like to include cellophane and 
make my own wood prints, I mean wood frames and source materials for metal frames and sourcing with frame shops. And I would also like to create a stronger website. This piece is called the Magenta Still Life and it is charcoal on uh, colored paper. And it's 17 by 23 inches. And finally, some advantages of working with me are that I have a collegiate experience with time management as well as honing in my art skills. I use communication and I'm very open with communication for phone calls, emails, as well as direct messages through social media. And I have national influence where I've already made five purchases across the United States, um, averaging or totaling over $500 so thus far. And I'm always open to objective criticism and advice. Thank you for listening if I have any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, I love all the pieces, very beautiful and creative. Um, I wanted to ask, I know you said you've made some sales. I think you said you were selling on Facebook. Is that Facebook Marketplace or just marketing on Facebook? So the Facebook page is upcoming right now, and I want to use both Facebook and Facebook Marketing gotcha. Marketplace. So my question was, with the sales that you've made and also your strategy going forward, what, what is your target customer? Are you targeting like young people, students, or just people that are particularly like well-versed in art and can appreciate your artwork, like what are the qualities that you're looking for your customers? So I'm not looking for a specific customer, only someone who's interested in fine art and understands that all of these pieces are original. And so with that being said, quality artwork doesn't necessarily mean cheap. You have to understand that it takes a lot of materials it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of commitment and creativity to be determined what kind of artwork you're going to get. And so my customers are just people who appreciate artwork and understand the work that goes into it. You're very talented in uh, some beautiful pieces that you showed us today. Tell me where you envision most of your sales coming from. Do you think you would do enough like top district bar festival to travel around? Do you think it would be custom pieces where people are contacting you through social media? But where do you envision sales coming from? So right now my sales are coming from all over the United States, including New Mexico, Illinois, Arkansas, and Georgia, just to name a few. And I have intentions of spreading my business all over the country, hopefully internationally. And so, with that being said, I just want my customer bases to be as spread out as to wherever my customers want to shop at. Because they, I have upcoming sales at the Image Idea Shop here in Starkville. I'm also joining a pop up shop coming up soon here in Starkville. And my website is available to anyone who has access to the website. Like they said, talent. Out was it? But um, mm -hmm. I'm curious. I, I don't know much about the space, but say and suppose that you blow up and we're all going to do. What happens? How are you going to manage the orders that are coming in? Are you the only artist? I assume so. But are you the only artist? Is there a plan to add other artists? Are there other people under you? What What's the plan? So right now I am the sole member of my business and I've been handling orders actually just fine with the flow that's been coming in. And I understand that with big business comes big flow. And I already have a lot of artwork created already. So I won't be behind on things unless a lot of commissions come in at once. And so then I'll have to kick up my time management once again and understand that I, when I schedule these purchases and these conditions, not to overlap them so that I can manage the time lines. Okay, and that is our fifth and final pitch. And again, please remember to, uh, to grab a People's Choice card. It is our error. Please be sure to write Kenya Imagines on the bottom if that's, um, if that's your desired vote. So please make sure to consider her in this uh, lineup here. What we will do is we will take a short break. 
Uh, when you finish your People's Choice card, please see one of our team members wearing the black Heat Center polo shirt. Judges, you are going to go with Miss Brooke Lambert standing there. Wait, Brooke, there's Brooke. So, and we are going to have uh, just a short recess while they deliberate, and we'll come back to announce the awardees. Stay tuned.
Sleepless nights, so uh, it was a it was definitely a tough decision here. Uh, before we get into announcing the winners, uh, first, once again, I would like to point your attention to the front of the program as a thank you to the sponsors that underwrite this: um, Bank Tell Systems, Riku Technology, J5 Global and Industry Services. Um, these these folks make this possible. So uh, thank you to the sponsors, um, judges. You. I got to see some fantastic presentations and a tough decision, and we wanted to give you all the opportunity to share some feedback to the group on the whole. So uh, we'll start with Shelby. Um, Shelby, what did you what did you think of tonight's presentation? Okay, um, everyone did a really great job. Congrats to all of you on the progress you've made so far. I think how we um, mentioned at the beginning, but Calvin and I pitched our business club ambassador at Startup Summit in 2019 and won. And that was our first pitch ever for both ambassador. And now it's our full-time job. It's what we do for a living. So that just goes to show that this one night can spark years ahead of success that you would never imagine. So congrats to all of you three for taking this step. Um, I guess as far as the presentations, I think the thing that all of us kept coming back to is like, you know, are these ideas viable? How much work has been done on them? How much traction do we have? How was the presentation? Like those are kind of the key components that we're looking at. I think everyone did such a great job. Um, if you ever, you know, if you want to continue pitching your businesses in the future and you want to get better at presentations or just figure out what you can improve, definitely go to the Entrepreneurship Center. Eric has helped Calvin and I specifically with our pitch countless times, just sitting in his office for hours to him helping us move lines around and figure out what should go on what slide and optimize it down to like the individual words on each page. So definitely take advantage of that resource if you ever need it, but you guys did a fantastic job. And no matter what the outcome is tonight, just keep your head up, keep going. I mean, I can't tell you guys how many, months, how many times we've been told no, you just can't let it get you down because you're going to hear no, that's how startups work. <laughs> so just keep going, you guys did a great job. Congratulations to everyone. Um, that's my piece. I'll move up to a um. <laughs> It's going to be hard to follow with that, but um, yeah, great job to everybody. Uh, it was it was a tough decision. It got dicey in there. We we're going back and forth, right about it, but any of you could have won. I feel like uh, everybody seemed like they put a lot of work into this presentation, a lot of work into their business. So for those that win, the work doesn't stop here. Um, you have to continue to work and grind and spend time developing your businesses. So uh, keep that in mind. And for those who don't win, the grind doesn't stop. Um, so, uh, like I said, you guys did a really good job. Proud of everybody. And uh, yeah. Echoing there, Kamala, uh, 
you guys all did a great job with a lot of talent here and, and a lot of people that I know are going to be consistent in the future. I look forward to seeing where y'all go. Um, when my wife and I travel, one of the, the coolest things that we do is when we go to the, uh, the stores everywhere from Napa Valley to Paris to London. And, uh, and we'll see a candle and flip up and the bottom of it will say, uh, made in Sarko. And so I hope KD will be uh, the next one that I flip over and make somewhere. And uh, we've got an England trip coming up. And we're going to see made in Sarko at a uh, boutique there in London. And uh, part on the wall from Can You Imagine would be great. And uh, I look forward to eating your food, hopefully, in Sarko. <laughs> And buying some clothes. So, congrats to everybody. Y'all did a great job. Okay. Um, before before we announce the winners here, I want to say thank you to my team. I get to stand up here and make a really bad job at emceeing, uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into making this event possible and getting entrepreneurs ready and organized and and. Uh, a first class event. So please help me in thanking my staff with Glamour, Nicole Taylor, Cass, Chase, with no I. I always mess up spelling his name, but please help me thank my team for such a All right, enough stalling. Y'all really don't want to hear me anymore. So uh, prizes. We'll start with the People's Choice Award judges. If you would come join us for a photo and a, um, delivering the checks here. So the People's Choice Award tonight will be going to H's Kitchen. Third place, winning five hundred dollars, will be going to the Barbista. Second place, winning $1,000, Kenya Imagines. Tomorrow's bank sale grand finale. KP Candle Co. Teams, congratulations again. All the presenters, such a fantastic job. The second thing I will just say is remember this is fun. This is the competition. Everybody's standing up. It, uh, we have seen great companies come out of this that didn't place, maybe placed less than first, and we've seen great companies that have won it. So please keep up, keep your head up, keep working, keep fighting. It's always about what you do tomorrow. Um, take a look at your program. We have 
Uh, the new product tree division coming here shortly, and then tomorrow we have the finale competition as well. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for joining. Thanks, judges, again. Y'all have a good night.
I say, I say the wrong. Testing, testing. Can you hear us? Testing, testing. Testing. Excellent.
right. <laughs> Just getting started with Pandora there. So welcome to Startup Summit 2022, our last preliminary competition, the new product three division. It has been an exciting week. We uh, are thankful for not having a tornadic interruption tonight as we did last night as we were announcing the winners of the uh, best brand competition. The tail end of that was when the sirens blew. So that was, that was interesting, uh, but I think we're good tonight. So uh, this competition is, is for our entrepreneurs that are working on a, a scalable innovation that can be carried well beyond the borders of Mississippi. These are some of the most advanced teams working through the entrepreneurship center. So I think you're gonna see the three prizes that will be presented as well as a People's Choice Award, which we'll get to in a moment. First, I'd like to introduce the judges who are joining us tonight and uh, let them say a couple words about themselves. The microphone's right there. So starting on my left here, Mr. Ben Hubbard, welcome. I can talk. I'm going to say, uh, yeah, Ben Hubbard, uh, Mr. State Grad, and way back in the day, I uh, co founded a software development firm back in 2009 for Brent and grew it to about six employees in four countries. Um, about 10 million in current revenue. So, uh, essentially, just kind of came time for me and my partner to quit. So, I got bought out of it and we got back in pocket. I did a couple of years of non profit work with Mr. Cody Academy until I was replaced by a much better person. <laughs> um, and I'm now currently the CEO of two different startups. So I have two different dev teams I'm running, building two different platforms. One is a uh, mobile e commerce app for the automotive market, so it's built to compute the vision. You can read a van the way you would read it, identify the vehicle, tie it to the fit van, show you the parts that we have in our network to do it. Um, and the other one is a crowdfund platform to crowdfund dollars for NCAA NIL. Several successful startups in the um, internet 
building software from the internet when it first got started and sold that company on to and I started a website for RV RVers to find campgrounds and and review them. That was our big part of the I sold that in 2013 and our current startup is working to take the internet away from Amazon and Microsoft and put them on the box so everybody has in their house and distribute the internet across the across the in everybody's houses instead of just these mega corporations. Thank you, Mr. Last but not least, Mr. Megan Walker, also with Glow. Yeah, it's always good to have two of us because I can finish down the story. So, um, <laughs> no, uh, we're really excited to be here. In fact, in 2015, uh, this was the competition uh, that we won that led to the trajectory of where we are now. So, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, yeah, we're, we're we're really excited. So we just went through a capital raise uh, valuing our company at 20 million. So from a student startup six plus years ago to uh, where we are now, we're really uh, elated and happy to be here. And uh, good luck tonight, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you our presenters tonight. You know, we never know where things can go because Glow was the winner of Eat Week what was then called E-Week, but this competition series in 2015, and now uh, you know, evaluation of featured in the New York Times article that released today. So the punchline is you never know where tonight's presentation can go. The whole point of the competition is to award some money. We are awarding a first prize of $2,500, a second prize of $1,000, third prize of $500, and then also a people's choice. So if you didn't get a program, Make sure you grab a program on. There's a note card in here. We will collect this from you at the end of the presentation. And we want to know who you're going to pick to be awarded $250. This money doesn't appear out of thin air. If you look at the front of your program, we have four fantastic sponsors, um, most of which are MSU alums that just care about helping entrepreneurship. Bank Health Systems, Reef Food Technology, J5 Global and Columbus and Industry Services Co. These folks literally are writing checks to Mississippi State University to fund the next ideas. If you see any of the people that represent these companies, please thank them for their kind support. Let's give them a round of applause. Logistics notes on the evening. So the presenters will have five minutes to give a presentation and then they will have three minutes for Q&A from the judges alone. Please let's take a note that the Q&A is just for the judges. If you have a burning question, you must ask the presenters. Please do so at the break in the back. That's why we have snacks and those nice tables for asking questions after the judges get their first shot. Um, beyond that, make sure you reach into your pocket, take anything that beeps, chirps, buzzes, or does any other noise making that could be disrespectful to the presenters and put those on some form of mode that will keep them quiet. We appreciate that very, very much. Without further ado, we will transition to the pitches now. So our first presenter will be Umo. Come on down. Hi, my name is Carmen Middleton. And I'm Karen Parker. And we are Umo, and we are building wearable technology to allow users to know the impact of their training. So I want to start off by asking who in here today has a smartwatch, maybe an Apple Watch or other. So we typically use these devices to track metrics such as sleep or step count. Well, everyday athletes are wanting this type of technology to assess elite level performance. Um, so we know that this technology is actually limited in its availability. It's going to be costly <laughs> and practical for everyday individuals. So also in this sector, wearable technology companies come out with these products, and these products have data associated with that. However, the data is not proven to be reliable and consistent. So how can consumers know that what they're paying for is actually accurate and reliable? So Umo's goal is to create effective and comfortable products that allow you to maximize the value. 
So our NZ3 Propel Smart Sock System incorporates sensors for the bottom of the sock application. We can look at metrics such as asymmetries, weight distribution, or sonar pressure information. We can also look at gate related parameters, so that can be heel strike or toe off. Um, and we incorporate these sensor technologies into the cotton fabric that's comfortable for the user. So all this technology and all these metrics are based on research from an NSF-funded project. Um, we initially conducted this research with an interview of over 100 professionals across the sectors, um, and their, their conclusion was they wanted data from the ground up. So that's why we're starting with smart sock applications. Professional athletic programs actually are already using similar technology in the form of force plates, and they're already collecting these metrics. Our solution just takes this technology and idea and incorporates it into a sock for a more practical application where they're able to take the information out of the weight room and move it to a game application. So what makes us unique is our product, as I said, is validated against gold standard equipment on the research side, so that you know that what you're actually getting is valid, it's a lab on that as well. Also, our sensing solution, we know that wearable technology needs to be comfortable for the user to actually um, use on a daily basis. So our sensing solution is actually quite minimal, so you can probably see from here, or ideally not see, because of how minimal it is, um, that this sensing solution incorporates in a way that's unintrusive on the user, allowing them to use our product for a sustained amount of time without being some sort of um, annoyance. As you know, any, I'm sure all of us have experienced some point in time um, getting something in your shoe can be quite annoying, so we can make sure our sensing solution accounts for that. And also, it integrates with other technologies, so our smart, our smart devices, our smart watches, we can uh, take that information and collectivize it into one dashboard for more information. So going over our financials, you can see unit financials for the first three products that we will tend to roll out. The first being our Propel Smart Sock, the second being a e-brace called Stabilize, and the third being a Smart Short called Strength. So you can see that these products are creating gross revenue between 53 and 74%, and with the Smart Sock being the most profitable of those. So these financials are based on unit costs on middle quarters of 100 units, and we are going to be using domestic manufacturing, and that's going to be great for the solution because if you have an increase in demand, um, we can create more products very quickly and make it very easy. Um, these tables only include direct and consumer sales, but we will also have business to business sales through partners like Lulu Women, uh, Academy Sports Outdoors, as well as licensing agreements with companies like Tonal and Peloton, who can brand their or our products with their name. Um, and sell them as an add on to their services. So, for our 48 month financial projections, you'll see we do have an increase in expenses from year one to year two, but that's based on uh, our product rollout in year two of the stabilized and the strength product. So, that first year will only be well. This also includes an increase in um, our staff for our sales and marketing. We'll have a similar increase in year three as we um, invest in product development for products 2.0 and 3.0. So our competitive advantage is twofold. We have knowledge of what wearable devices um, can do and can't do. And since we validated our competitors' products, we know where they have failed and we know what to avoid from creating ours. And so we also have an advisory board of um, a bunch of different backgrounds. So kinesiology, textiles, electrical engineering, all of these are very important for wearables. And we've seen a lot of our competitors not focus on the textiles, not focus on how it fits on the body when they're making these products. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Um, and we're happy to take questions. Hey, um, so do you have a patent or a pathway to patent this to protect the technology? You didn't mention that at all. Yes, so we do have an intellectual um, property patent that has been filed. So you filed, so you filed for a patent, full patent on the um, I believe so. And it's been approved, so. Wait, so you've been awarded a patent? Yes. Okay. That was uh, the initial investigation with the NSF uh, that funded the research development of it, and that was uh, part of that process of black meat as well. So. Okay, and so there's another question. Is there a need or an ability to build like a patent fence around this? Do you have multiple kind of spin off patents from this one to that one? Did you patent soft technology first? So the patent actually covers um, 
motion sensing in a number of different markets with a number of different sensing technologies. We got, we got pretty broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're actually in the last year of that funding. So um, it started, I believe, in 2018, um, and it got a few no cost extensions because of the pandemic. Um, we're delaying a little bit, um, but so it's it's been a time. You guys are part of that research. I didn't know you were looking at the data from. No, we're we are actively a part of that research. So we're in the lab every day testing wearable devices, both our own and other people's. That's awesome. I thought you were like looking at research data with our app. Um, real quick on that the technology piece of like stock, I was going to ask what is the longevity of the product, and then also is it waterproof? That like more than just sweat. I know that, like they have more about that for you, but except the puddle, is it gonna, you know, keep working? Yeah. So we're actually working right now with IPC, um, who's a organization creating new standards for wearable technology, so that we can make sure our products are the first ones using these new standards, um, so that our customers have. Um, trust in our product that it, it's going to last how long it says. So those standards include abrasion resistance, washability, resistance to sweat, resistance to water, all of those things. Um, so they have battery on the glass. Um, and it's, did you develop the sensor yourself, or is it the same sensor that you're using yourself? Yeah. So the sensing solution is actually outsourced. It's more about the integration and placement, which is what happened before. Um, so we're currently pursuing commercial prototypes. We developed the research prototypes over the last five years, but we're at a stage right now where um, in order to actually sell this, we have to go through what we quickly learned is a much different process than just what we can do on our own. So we're working with commercial partners to manufacture our solution um, so that we can scale it eventually as well. That is your question. Okay, thank you. So do you currently have a prototype? So we currently have our first commercial prototype that we're investigating. Um, as I mentioned, a big part of what we're trying to do is validate our hardware before we push it out there. Um, in our experience working with these types of professionals across the industry, they want to make sure that their technology is actually valuable and uh, accurate. So we're pursuing that method in prototypes we get in, we test them with our gold standard equipment, and then we'll uh, make decisions from there. Okay, and the patent actually is great. Yes, at Instagram, it's under y'all. So it's, I believe it's under our advisory board member, um, currently under his name, but it's, it's going to come from well. Yes, sure. So is, is this like a hard window sensor? This is a passive base sensor. Um, we're not locked into the specific sensing technology. Um, there's a, like a whole host of different sensors that you can use for this application. The great thing about this sensor is it stays linear, which basically means as the signal changes, um, it changes accordingly. Um, so if we look at something like a force plate measure, as you step on it, it's not going to exponentially increase once it hits a certain point. So these sensors do the same thing across the band. That would be our last question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Mr. Timothy Wonro with Untrigger. Hello, my name is Timothy Wonro. So there's a very large group of people right now have a very unique problem, and they're willing to pay a lot of money to fix this problem, but it's currently not the product available to help them. Misophonia is a narrow auditory condition where specific noises will trigger somebody's spike flight response, causing extreme anger or panic. You know the feeling that you get when you suddenly get scared? You jump. There's a shock of adrenaline. There's, there's an extreme, intense, and immediate reaction to being scared. Now imagine that 
process of being scared, having to calm yourself down, lower your adrenaline, is happening every time you hear a sound. That's what misophonia is. And the sounds that cause this reaction are not even rare sounds, they're very common. It could be eating, it could be humming, it could be eating certain kinds of footsteps causing this extreme reaction. So I'm sure it's not an exaggeration when you could say, I will hit you on the head with the guitar and it would cure you. And you would have over 100 people willing to pay you $5,000 to hit them on the head with the guitar. Now, people with misophonia have been dealing with this disorder for a long time. So they've developed some coping mechanisms. A lot of people use noise canceling headphones or earbuds, which do take care of the sounds that happen around us. But they cancel out all sounds, isolating the user from their environment. Other people opt for physical isolation, just simply avoiding situations where they might be triggered. But this causes them to avoid human interaction, especially with their loved ones. And still other people opt for self-harm and drugs, which obviously are not a good way to deal with this reaction. And while these coping mechanisms, mechanisms may help somewhat with triggers that happen in the real world, what about triggers in recorded media? If you're watching a TV show, you can't put on the most canceling headphones, you're already wearing headphones. One of the biggest things that I've heard from my fellow misophones is that podcasts in particular are almost impossible to listen to. Because if you're watching a TV show and the character starts eating, it's triggering you. You can skip ahead a couple minutes and kind of get the gist of the story. With a podcast, if the host is snacking, the host will always be snacking. So you have no choice but to completely avoid that podcast forever. I did a survey recently and it showed that over 500,000 people in the US alone really want to listen to podcasts, but it can't because of triggers. So into this desperate market steps untriggered. Untriggered is a podcast streaming service that uses AI to identify trigger sounds and audio and remove them. So you guys at this point probably know the dripping sound, and now it's gone. That's what Untriggered does. It takes a podcast full of snacks, rest, clicks, things that will severely trigger a person, runs them through the AI, and outputs a clean podcast, safe from triggers and safe from the fear of triggers. And this AI is not theoretical. I've tested it on many podcasts and it can remove trigger sounds. I can listen to the podcast after it's run through the AI. So we plan to market this podcast streaming service in a multiple of ways. There are a couple online communities that are help people with misophonia. There's some on Reddit and Facebook, with tens of thousands of users who we can reach immediately with this product. We also plan to reach out using common misophonia resources like the misophonia podcast or the annual convention happening later this year. And we plan to connect with influential figures in the misophonia world so that they can spread the word as well. Now, this streaming service will be sold as a subscription with a free tier supported by ads and a paid tier, five dollars a month, no limit on the amount of podcasts that you can listen to. A financial model done by students here at State with some conservative growth estimates show a annual revenue of almost three million dollars by year four. But this is just a small application of this AI that we've developed. We're limited by data collection and capabilities. Data collection is expensive, it's tedious, it requires some in-depth knowledge of the problem being solved. And with our small amount of funding, we can only focus on the small application of podcasts. But with more funding, we can expand this AI to be able to cancel out any trigger sound on a phone, tablet, a computer in real time, growing our available market dramatically and increasing revenue more than tenfold. With your support, we can begin to remove trigger sounds from the lives of people with misophonia and build a world of auditory peace. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Good job. I remember, did you pitch a few years back a hardware yeah. version of them? Oh, it's, it's gone through a couple of pitches, yeah. Very, very cool. Also, I didn't know that I suffered from this, but your presentation was about the graphic monitors, so you might have another uh, uh, subscriber right off the list. Oh, well, 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 <laughs> Who built AI? Did you build it? Yeah. Yeah. So they don't control that or cement. They utilize that pretty much everything. You utilize that now? Uh so I've been working with computers for about six, seven years. I'm a industrial engineering major, but I'm doing computer science on the side and that's been a deep dive into AI. So I'm actually doing research with it right now. Another question um, from my classroom. You looked at trying to uh, process patents. Yeah, I'm actually currently uh, in the process of finding a patent lawyer to actually build it out. I work with OTM on campus, and I've 
process every podcast you can't do it live yet how far are you with them so far um so i i'm still a little bit far away because the main problem is that the lag um so i'll have to i'll have to work a lot on developing the neural network to minimize lag so in that aspect i was a little bit far away that's how i started the podcast so we can basically prove the idea then we work on the thank you thank you thank you Okay, our next presentation is going to be Mr. Garrison Walker with Hush Puppy. Come on down.
identify if we have the communities that may have traditional campus. Yes, yes, there's actually, uh, well, for one, the local high schools around here, so we're going to back up for one. So uh, we use Cabell and Tech Rally sporting events and whatnot. But across the country, um, there are several other universities, and I think a pro team that may use cowbells. I haven't exactly uh, concluded how big that market is, where we could reach out and say, hey, maybe we could make your own design or colors and see what you like. Um, just because we did start localized and then we're really working around that. Um, but yes, we, we definitely were looking into other areas that we could pursue. We did that actually with the chairman. I think it came close to seven to our members. But who's assigned to it? So you may be the inventor, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're the inventor of the patent. And then who's actually assigned to the company? Oh, yes, yes, sorry. So you're the inventor and you're yes. assigned to the company. Sorry. So who owns the company now? Um, it's me, me and my business partner. So I'm team title to the patent. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so the patent is a Because uh, that was kind of one thing that came to our mind when we started this out. And um, 
And what we, after interviewing people and talking to people, even before we even designed the thing to begin with, they were like, well, if there are multiple designs that I can come back to, that I, that's why it's many that I, that, that, you know, we're calling my name. And so we were like, okay, so that's one way to keep going about it, whether it's a messy formation or something completely unique, customizable. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the main the main outlet. And then again, I guess if we expand to more products, that would also be the reason. Okay, that'll have to be our last question. Thank you very much. <laughs>
unfortunately, paraprofessionals are not given the same amount of training that teachers are, but they are expected to provide students with rigorous instruction. Nate and I have made EDA so that teaching staff could perform ABA consistently and successfully, regardless of the level of training they have been able to receive. Ever since the first um, publication of ABA, parents of exceptional learners have been seeking experts in the field to help their children. Now, however, this app gives them the ability to prov um, provide the expert intervention themselves. Also, for the last 50 years, ABA was too bulky to be successfully transported between the school, therapy, and home environments. If we look at this visual, we see that the Exceptional Data Book app really doesn't have any competition. Competition. Data Finch is the closest after paper, pen, and note cards. But despite being very intimidating, it does not have the automatic features that ADA possesses that saves the teacher so much time. Our customer base is 8 million strong and includes paraprofessionals, teachers, and families. We have tailored our advertising plan to target each individual group with social media being used to reach all three groups. Editor will cost $22 per month, and if we assume to have a 10% penetration in this market, we will have a $17 million a month revenue. Is this? EDA is, the, yeah. is in the beta, beta stage of development. If we are fortunate enough to win any prize yeah. money here in the yeah. Mississippi State yeah. University yeah. Startup Summit, yeah. we would put it towards hiring a graphic designer, yeah. making professional yeah. training videos and advertising. Here is our team comprising of Joyce Cohane, Wendy Ashcroft, Grace Toddy, and the Mississippi State Marketing Class. Um, this is, of course, Nate and myself. Um, and we thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Nate, Natalie, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, great. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give judges my cell phone. Can you speak one more time? Yes. Okay. Let's do it this way. Yeah. Make sure we don't get Hi. <laughs> hey, so, so you mentioned you're in beta, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have actual live beta testers, beta sites, and who are they? So the primary beta tester is Natalie. Yes. Um, your assistants also use it, correct? My assistants have used it, and I'm starting to introduce it to other to other SPED classrooms in my building. Okay. Have you identified any other? Um, so where are you? You like it, it doesn't matter. So like, have you identified any other professionals who can beta test with you? to do some market validation and see what they think to feed that back in and help the product. Yes, I am actually um, been put in a position to help uh, teach all my uh, SPED teachers in my district and uh, start kind of getting feedback from more directions. Okay. Um, we'll just go down the line here. Hi, Natalie. I have a few questions written down. I know you said $22 a month was the investment, um, but there was a slide where it said, something about why would families consider that investment? Is the investment by the family or the educational institution? 
So whoever is buying the app. So for the teacher, um, we'll use the app in the classroom, but if parents want to carry over that same high level of intervention at home through summers and weekends and even after school, because it doesn't take long to actually perform the discrete trial, um, then they can also purchase the app and it will be super user friendly because the teacher will send exactly the trial that the, te- the student's working on currently. So if it's, if it's being used by the school system where their child is enrolled, um, would the parent have access to it just to see their child's progress and basically just have access to their child's data from the day? And if like to access that data, if their school system's already using it, will the parents still have to pay for it? Um, it would, there has never been before been a media where uh, parents of SPED students have been able to keep up with that data just because of how, as we said, bulky it was. We literally carry around notebooks to take data on. Um, so this would be something completely new to the SPED field. Uh, I foresee us making the option where districts can buy it just for their teachers and paraprofessionals or for their teachers, paraprofessionals and parents, um, or just doing the first one and letting the parents purchase it separately. We'll give options. Right. Um, And just building on that question real quick, and I'll pass it for time's sake. Um, On the data point, I I certainly get parents not have, my mom is a special education teacher, and uh, my sister's a paraprofessional. And so I definitely get, there historically was not a lot of transparency when it came to curriculum and, and performance and data. Um, But when it comes to like particularly cloud-based data versus just written uh, records at a school system, parents and the general public all get a little wary. Have you considered security and privacy concerns or even just regulations when it comes to data of minors, particularly vulnerable minors that are uh, pretty young and the access that their parents might be entitled to and whether you can offer that in a package or whether they're entitled to that anyway? That's a very good question. And the answer, of course, is we always want to dig more deeply into this. But um, right now, we aren't even considering cloud-based computing at all. All the data is stored locally. And when Mm -hmm. a teacher wants to use that data for something to transfer it, it's a copy that goes from a local machine to another local machine. And so there is security that way. That doesn't mean it's ironclad or completely foolproof, but it doesn't use cloud or internet storage systems. And then to answer your question also, um, at this point, I'm uh, telling all of my teaching staff to only use initials um, instead of full names for the students. And that's something I'm going to consider bringing forward as the app develops. Uh, Also, at the end of every week, you will print off the data sheet. So you also still have that hard copy in the school, just like we have always had. It's just going to be a lot less space taken up. It's going to be one page per all of their objectives for a week. So it's going to be a lot less space um, and parents will still have that hard access to come in and look um, like they have in the past. Perfect. Great job, guys. My question for about privacy too. So I covered that. Um, I just got handed the phone. So um, oh. I, I just am going to say that I think you did an excellent job. Um, and how, how, how much data do you think that you collect in a notebook per student over the oh. course of a, of a year? Wow. Um, I can, it's a lot. Um, I wish I had one with me right now. I mean, they're about this thick. Um, and it's filled with what we do um, every day with them. And then one more question real quick. How, how much time doing it the old way did you spend per week per student? Okay, so if we're just talking about data collection, it's about an hour per IEP student. Um, but if per we're week, t- right. per, week, per, week. per week, yes. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about also creating their decks, which is what happens at the uh, initial uh, annual, every annual IEP, and maintaining their decks as well, um, that increases. But as, if it's just the data collection, it is an hour per student. So I have 15 students. I am spending, me and my paraprofessionals are spending 15 hours a week pre app just on data collection. And that's not working with the kid. That's, they have gone through and now I'm writing in what they got right, what they got wrong and all that. 
Awesome. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right. Thank you, team. Appreciate your logistical uh, consideration <laughs> here. We are going to um, uh, take a break and do some evaluation. So we'll, we'll tune you all back in in just a moment. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Eric.
All right, folks, if you would take your seats, we'll make the announcement here in about three minutes. Okay. Well, let me tell you, after nights of doing this all week, that was by far the toughest judge deliberation. Uh, and I would I would venture to say, however, probably the most thorough. Is that fair, team? Have you been there? Yeah. yeah I was, uh, there it was, you know, good presentation, ideas, <laughs> yeah, so I'd love the judges to share your observations. Ben, do you want to expand any further? Uh, yeah, uh, for me it was looking at the several things. One, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just trying to. Person, the team versus and the big thing for me is this: where you are thinking now, the viability of the market work. Right? So that was one of my big ones. And then the feasibility of it. Of, so because y'all have different places, feasibility of the idea and where you are in the market. Um, yeah, I would say it was also really fast. Yeah. Yeah. I would say with all this back, it was fast and a lot to consider. And I would say, um, if you presented tonight, no matter how you did, please keep trying on them. That's like one of my, uh, it's not a big factor, it's probably my favorite factor in terms of things like this. And if you have some decisions, is to see who keeps going, uh, you know, even if maybe someone is not still their way or maybe someone turned on their idea. So uh, if you believe in it and it's something that you really want to do, stick with it. So we're really glad for that. Well, there were um, so many really, really good presentations. I mean, that was a tough, a tough, you know, who's first, second, third, 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 third. And all, um, I like software stuff because I'm a software guy, so leaning in that direction, but um, they're all good. Hearing more about what you're, what you do in the future. Um, really good job. I just want to say, as someone who made little light of ice cubes, um, there are a lot of things that you are early on, and um, you know, wherever you land tonight, I just want to say, really good work. Um, don't let this dictate what you do next. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, and then the second thing, everyone did phenomenal. That was. Uh, Anna and I have been on prep for three years now. Uh, it's a board for uh, students coming through the youth center, and that was one of the hardest deliberations that we've had to go through. So, really good work from everyone, to top teams, and uh, best of luck in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so, my, I think my very first one of these I did with Eric Mitten was like five or six years ago. And the team didn't win. We didn't put in the win. We thought that was a bad presentation of the So I went up to that team afterwards, like, hey, I'm in your world. Let me help you. And I know that company is still in existence. I don't think the other two exist, right? So, like, you may not win tonight. Someone may come talk to you after and help you keep going. You can still be around in five or six years, and the win may not be. So, you just never know. Let's give our judges a round of applause.
And we signed several checks. And again, just as a reminder, the only reason we can sign checks is because of sponsors. And those sponsors, in all cases, were, um, were entrepreneurs themselves. And they believe so much in the process and what we're doing here to write checks to fund you. So again, please take note of the, um, the companies on the front, Bank Tell, Reed, J5, and Industry Services Code. If you know the people or know all the people, find a way to say thanks to them because it really makes all the difference in this whole event possible. Speaking of the event possible, um, those of you who have been around the entrepreneurship program for years, we've done Startup Summit. Actually, we were tallying this up the other day, and I believe this is the 12th year that there have been business plan competitions in some form at Mississippi State. But at any rate, if you're here tonight, you recognize that this is probably one of the um, one of the best run, run summits we've had in since I've been here, as thanks to Ms. Brooke Lammer, who coordinates this whole event. The team that supports her, please help me in thanking my team. And <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. How else can I stall? <laughs> Nobody wants to know. Chase is giving me very much of his time to go on. Okay. <laughs> well, let's start with our People's Choice Award for $250 voted by you. Your choice tonight. Judges, please join me up here. We can uh, present the check, which is going to Hush Puppy. Congratulations. Two nights ago, I was standing here and completely stalled on one of the teams, and I started writing it down after this just to make sure because it would be really awful to screw up. Third place tonight is being awarded to Umo. Congratulations. Second place, a winner of $1,000 is being awarded to the ABA Discreet Trial Lab. Congratulations, Nate and Natalie. Let's flip to your Zoom screen here. Thank you all so very much. That's awesome. There they are. Maybe we can do an audience pan so they can see them. <laughs> And next time we're in Starkville, we have this lovely giant check that may or may not cash. <laughs> All right. Last but certainly not least, first place, the winner of $2,500, and who will go on to compete at the Bank Tell Grand Finale tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Taylor Auditorium. Country. And let's just say it was a bit hotly debated by the judges of whether the uh, dripping noise was a pro or a con. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, congratulations again to all the teams. As I tell everybody, remember, this is just fun, right? You have five minutes, you get a window to show five minutes in your whole scheme. And so it really is truly about having a fun night, throwing around a little bit of money and working on great companies, but it's always about what you do tomorrow has been reinforced by the judges. Keep working. Thanks for being here. Hope you can join us tomorrow for the grand finale. Everybody have a good night.